Elite Society News. My name is Paul Lathrop. I am the founder of the Self-Defense Radio Network, and obviously I'm the host of Polite Society Podcast. <coughs> Excuse me. Joining me today for Legal Friday, Alex Uli joins me as he does every other Friday. We're going to talk about a couple of legal things, and we're going to get into a little bit of not legal advice, but uh, uh, advice on what to do. Uh, if you're armed and you encounter law enforcement. Alex, thanks for coming along today, man. Yeah, great to be with you, Paul. So let's get started. We do have a little bit of legal news to cover, and we're going to cover this very briefly because I'm just finishing setting the show up and had just enough time to have a brief conversation with Alex. But we do have two legal things that have happened today. The Supreme Court has accepted the Cargill case for this uh, this go-around. Also, the Seventh Circuit made some news today when they stayed the injunction against Illinois assault weapon ban. Sounds like one bit of good news and one bit of not bad news. But uh, I think on Twitter I saw uh, I saw that uh, Tom Gresham said this is not we're not even at halftime yet. Wait till we hit the two minute drill, which is what he's referring to when it gets to the Supreme Court. What, what's what's your thoughts, Alex, on, on these two things? Well, I, I think it's great news with respect to the Cargill case, which is obviously the bump stock ban that was instituted during the Trump administration in the aftermath of the Las Vegas massacre. And of course, that was a compromise at the time. I, I, I obviously don't support, I don't particularly like bump stocks, but of course, I don't support a bump stock ban. I think that they fall within the definition of arms. Uh, within the, the meaning of the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. And I think they're clearly protected by the Second Amendment. And I think the, the Supreme Court will uh, overturn the bump stock ban, find that it's unconstitutional, and hopefully rein in uh, the ATF to some degree because, of course, this was not passed legislatively. It was a, at the direction of uh, the executive branch uh, to implement this ban. So. Uh, this was not not something a ban that was implemented through the, the normal legislative process. That was what we've been talking about quite a bit on the podcast is uh, overreach by an administrative authority. So uh, that's that's good news. I think that the Supreme Court will come down on the right side in, in that case. Of course, the other case that we've uh, known for some time that the Supreme Court would be reviewing is the Rahimi case, also out of the Fifth Circuit, which involves uh, the prohibition under 18 U.S.C. 922G, uh, uh, the prohibition on people subject to a domestic violence restraining order from possessing a firearm. So this is an interesting case because it's not an arms ban case. It's, it's the first time, actually, that the Supreme Court will be addressing what is meant by the people uh, under the Second Amendment and who is part of the people. So I think this will be an interesting discussion from the Supreme Court for that reason. But of course, this one is concerning for a, uh, a number of reasons, but primarily concerning because the uh, the defendant uh, in the case, or the plaintiff in the, in the case, uh, rather, uh, Mr. Rahimi, is not a savory character. Uh, he's, he's not a good dude by any stretch of the imagination. So it will be interesting to see how the Supreme Court handles the facts of the case uh, in their analysis. And that's coming up for oral argument in just a few days on November the 7th. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I'm sure there will be lots of discussion to be had in the uh, after the oral argument in that case. And then the other case that you mentioned, Paul, is the one out of the Seventh Circuit, where in a two-to-one decision, the Seventh Circuit upheld the assault weapons ban uh, in Illinois. So uh, that ban remains in effect. That's not terribly surprising. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about Judge Easterbrook, uh, who is who was appointed uh, to the bench by a Republican president, but has not been friendly to the Second Amendment. And I, I don't have a lot of insight into this uh, particular uh, judge with respect to, you know, sort of the politics and dynamics of the, the courts, uh, the circuit court, and with respect to the Supreme Court. But uh, apparently he is a judge who is uh, felt short shrift because he was never selected for the Supreme Court. And uh, I don't know that that's got anything to do with his decision in this particular case, but uh, there is some speculation that he likes for the spotlight to be on him uh, as a result of him not having uh, been selected to the Supreme Court. 
of course, I don't know that to be true. I don't have any insight, personal insight in that regard, but that's uh, been the, I think it was uh, Mark Smith from Four, Four Boxes Diner who uh, made that commentary. So uh, an interesting decision to read. I haven't read the decision yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it just to see uh, how he gets around the Bruin decision uh, to uphold the assault weapons ban. I'm the last time, and, and I only have done this in my adult life once, and that was for the uh, for the uh, recent. Uh, um, God, God, my brain just went in, went into full lockdown for the Bruin decision. Uh, when, when Bruin was up for oral arguments, the first time in my adult life, I actually looked for the oral arguments and listened to the oral arguments live. Um, I think I'm going to be doing that again for the Rahimi case. Uh, I, I was. I was able when I listened to the arguments in the uh, in the Bruin case. I was having a, a conversation with uh, Teresa. Um, God, got it. Uh, Einacker from New I Jersey, yeah. and uh, and and she is licensed to argue in front of the Supreme Court. And I I was th- when when I tuned in. The questions weren't so great. She goes, "Hang on, Gorsuch hasn't asked, and Thomas hasn't asked, and 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 through listening to the oral arguments, I was able to get a idea that we were gonna win the Bruin decision. I just didn't know how big, and it turned out it was huge. So I, I believe on the Rahimi case, I'll be I'll be tuning in as well, just so I can see if I can, in my totally amateur status, read tea leaves again." Well, um, amateur or not, sometimes it's difficult to read the tea leaves based on oral argument. Um, you can pretty much expect uh, or pretty much guess what justices are going to ask questions that seem to be more favorable to the Second Amendment, which judges, justices are going to ask questions that seem less favorable. Uh, but you can get some insight, I, I think, into where, where the decision is going to go and what the justices think are going to be important. But... Um, as we all know, Justice Thomas wrote the Bruin decision, and he's very quiet during oral argument, typically. So uh, it, it's difficult to know uh, exactly where the opinion's going to land. All right. Well, let's let's get into because we've burned up almost uh, nine minutes now just talking about these two uh, brief things coming up uh, in the legal arena. Let's go ahead and what we planned on doing today, and just to add a little bit of an explanation. We were, uh, what this show is, used to be its own uh, podcast in Named the Bullet. Well, since I've changed my employment or my employment has changed, uh, this gets folded into polite society now. And that's a much, much, much larger podcast audience. So while we're doing this, I thought we would reintroduce some things we've talked about on the former show but may not reach this larger or may not have reached this larger audience. So uh, what I want to do, Alex, is there we if you're listening to us, hopefully you've made the decision. You go armed every day, pants on, gun on and that you carry on a regular basis. Every once in a while, in my personal experience, it's every once in a great while. But it happens that I have to interact with law enforcement Um let, I want to start with let's the, the most common way people interact with law enforcement, in my experience, is a traffic stop. You're driving along. You may be going a little bit over the speed limit, or you may have forgotten to signal your lane change or a million different reasons why you may get pulled over by a law enforcement officer, and you're armed like you are all the time. What happens when the law enforcement officer comes up to your window uh, what should that look like for you to make it through this without any any uh issues so there are a few things that you want to consider here there are legal considerations and then there are sort of more practical or tactical considerations and that they don't always result in the same uh, outcome uh, based on the analysis of each but the first thing you want to know is whether or not you are in a state that has a duty to inform. So there are some states, and I don't have an exhaustive list here. I think, see if I can pull it up. 
but there are some states when you are pulled over, you have a duty to inform the officer whether or not you are carrying. Uh, for instance, Michigan is one of those. Uh, North Carolina is one of those. Texas is one of those, although it's got some nuance, and there are a number of others as well. I know North Dakota, and Paul, you may have some insight into this. I don't, I don't know. I know you're in South Dakota, but North Dakota being a neighboring state, you may have some insight that I don't. There's a little bit of a quirk with theirs as well for residents versus non-residents. But if you are in a duty to inform state, you have to inform the officer that you are carrying a firearm. And we'll talk about how to do that here in just a second. I'll, uh, do you have any insight with respect to North Dakota? Well, I want to bring up two. Yes, North Dakota, if you are a non-resident, I believe it is, you must inform residents. Different story. Uh, also, Nebraska, if you are, Nebraska is, is one that's unique in the entire United States is in that if you interact with emergency medical services, you must inform them. Uh, and that's, that's really, uh, that's the only state I know of where it's, anything but law enforcement so um and then also i know ohio and they had a really big kerfuffle uh going on several years ago now it's been at least six or seven years ago they had a really big duty to inform uh case i want to say it was out of canton where an officer and it went viral on the internet just went nuts on this guy when he tried to inform and the officer wouldn't shut up to let him inform and then threatened to kill the, the guy and I'll be absolutely legal doing it uh, and the, the officer obviously rightfully got fired but that that case still sticks in my head yeah well and, and luckily Ohio changed their law and it's no longer a duty to inform state uh, so that's that's good news but the first so the first thing you should know is are you in a state that has a duty to inform because that's some it's something you absolutely need to know. In some states, you have to inform immediately. Yes, and that was the issue with that Ohio case. Um, and a good place, and, and I know you use this this resource as well, a good place to find out is handgunlaw.us. And right at the top of the page, when you click on any particular state you may be going through or to, there is a must-inform law enforcement uh, uh, tab that says whether you must inform or not. Yeah, exactly. I, I just pulled up handgunlaw.us uh, in front of me right here, and I clicked on South Dakota. And just like you say, Paul, it's right in the top right portion of the digest there. It, it says, must inform officer immediately. No. So uh, you, you have a pretty good idea. I wouldn't rely on handgunlaw.us uh, as a source of law necessarily, the primary source of law, but I would. it's a great resource to look quickly to find out uh, what the law is, and then you, it has links to the actual law itself if you want to confirm uh, what is contained in the digest that they provide with the actual law in the state because it links to the Legislative Assembly website for most of these these laws uh, for citation. So so it's a great, great resource and one of the best that, that I've seen. There are others as well, other good ones, uh, but I really like handgunlaw.us and know that it's uh, updated regularly. So... That's another important thing, obviously. So know the law, know whether or not you have a duty to inform. But the next thing is, how do you interact with the officer? And even if you are in a state that does not require you to inform the officer, should you nevertheless inform the officer? The first thing I would tell people is that, especially if it's dark, I would turn on the light in your vehicle uh, so yep. that the officer can see where you are and what you're doing. Because... The officer doesn't know who you are. The officer doesn't know whether uh, you're a good guy or a bad guy, has no clue. And so if you can bring transparency to the situation, I think that's a good thing. It helps put the officer at ease a little bit. Uh, the next thing is you should put your hands on the steering wheel before the officer uh, walks up to your vehicle. The officer being able to see your hands is another thing that helps put the officer at ease. Uh, you do not want this to turn into a situation where you or the officer are in danger because of a lack of communication or because of some misperception about what you're doing with your hands and where you're putting your hands. The other thing is is when the officer uh, asks for your license and registration, of course, depending on where your firearm is, you may want to go ahead and inform the officer. Uh, if the, uh, For instance, if your license is in your wallet, 
and it's right next to your firearm, if you're left-handed, for instance, and your wallet is in your left pocket, uh, you would probably want to go ahead and inform the officer because the officer may see it when you reach for your wallet. You don't want to surprise the officer by reaching towards your firearm when you are in fact reaching towards your wallet. So be cognizant of those sorts of factors. With that said, going back to the point about whether you should go ahead and inform the officer, even if you are in a state that does not require you to inform the officer, I generally think it's a good idea. That's going to be mostly a personal decision, but I think it's a good idea because the officer is less likely to be surprised and the stop is more likely to go smoothly. Now, some people may say the officer doesn't have any business knowing whether or not I'm armed. And I think that's a perfectly respectable position to take. Uh, just make sure that the firearm is secured in your holster or wherever you have it in your vehicle so that it's never in a position where it looks like you're reaching for your firearm and the officer may feel like they're in danger. Um, so that's the first thing. The next thing is if you are going to inform, how do you inform the officer? And this is really important. You don't want to say, I've got a gun, because that comes across in a threatening manner. You want to say, officer, uh, I'm licensed to carry a firearm. I'm exercising that right. What would you like me to do? And uh, make sure whatever the officer tells you to do that you are crystal clear about how he wants you to proceed here she wants you to proceed and if he does want you to turn over your firearm um, be very careful about how you do that I would suggest depending on where the firearm is that you get out of the vehicle and ask him to take the firearm out of your holster if it's in your holster uh, that's the probably the safest way to do it um, any, I don't know, any any thoughts or suggestions, Paul, before I go on? Well, I've, I've in my former life as a truck driver, I had I had a few circumstances over the 20 years I drove to inform, and almost universally, when I informed, the the it would it was not a big deal. Uh, it was the the response. And one particular time when I was in Pennsylvania. The response I loved the most from an officer I got was, I tell you what, you don't draw yours, I won't draw mine. The first, the, the first thing you want to know is where it was, and I said, it's on my right hip, and, uh, and I was concealed at that time. He said, I tell you what, you don't draw yours, I, don't, I won't draw mine. And I thought that was, a, that was the best response I'd ever, I'd ever gotten. And uh, even then, I made, very careful, I made very careful to make sure my hands were in front of my body and not anywhere near my right side and, and all through that interaction with the officer. Um, the other thing that I want to bring up about this is when always, 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 when you're, if you are armed, well, actually two things. Number one, you are a representative of us, meaning the larger, gar uh, the larger gun owning community. So be a good example and second be respectful to the law enforcement officer that's gonna that's gonna do two things for you it's going to if if, it, if it's, it's possible to mitigate what the charges the officer what the ticket the officer is, is considering it may cause you benefit there and it will absolutely go further in you leaving with the same amount of holes in you that you started the interaction with uh, do not do not ever try to ask don't ever try to escalate and try to de-escalate any stress in the in the uh, situation remember both of you are armed and and the officer is most likely wearing body armor you're most likely not hey, you're both armed and you both want to go home so do what you can to make the interaction as smooth as possible and i think you're right paulie i mean you're i think your interaction is probably more typical uh, at least in the more conservative states, the more gun-friendly states, uh, I think the officers generally know that somebody with a license to carry a firearm is a very law-abiding person, and they know that they're probably dealing with a good person. So um, if, when you inform them, that's probably going to be their response. You keep it in your holster, I'll keep mine in my holster. Before we so, go on, can I get a couple comments in here? Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, uh, let me get this one up. Uh, this is Jesus Wind slash Bird of Michigan. Oops, I got the wrong one up there. Just a minute. Uh, why why is that not popping into the correct area? Um, ah, 
Uh, that could be why. There we go. And try this again. There we go. Uh, Jesus Wind says, late again. Engine off, dome light on, hands on top of the steering wheel. That's something you had said, Alex. He actually had that comment up before you said that, but that's that's something we both said is, is try to make the officer at ease. Try to let him know that that you've got nothing to hide. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think the, the engine off, I didn't mention that, but engine off I think is good advice as well. I, I think I heard that first from Masad Ayub. Uh, he advises people to turn the engine off because it, is, it does happen. It's rare, but it does happen where the, the officer who conducts a traffic stop walks up to the vehicle and they are injured when the person puts the vehicle in reverse and then takes off. Um, so they'll back the car up real quick, hit the officer and leave. So by turning the engine off, you are putting the officer at ease that that won't happen. All right, let's see here. Uh, get this one up here and this is from warsaw patriot be a good example and learn understand the boundaries of the laws you are in that's yeah it, and again that goes back to researching where you're going to be uh, it's it's extremely common for me to i live 12 miles from the minnesota border i think i live eight miles from the iowa border i'm in both states probably uh, if not weekly, at least every other week, I'm in I'm in one or both states. I've been there enough. I know the laws by heart for those states. But if you're going to be going on a road trip, know where the law, what the law is in the state you're traveling through, and and you got to know you got to know what your responsibility is. Yeah, and I think it's useful maybe to mention just one more time that handgunlaw.us. Uh, it's a great resource and. and the, I can't remember the name of the person that runs it. Do you know, Paul? Um, Gary Slider uh, runs HandgunLaw.us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He, uh, I know he does an excellent job keeping that website up to date. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and continue. I don't think we're going to get to the second part of our discussion today. We may have to hold that for two weeks. But uh, let's continue on with, uh, with interacting in, in general life with law enforcement. Is there a point where, uh, and I want to bring up one other thing I've heard, and this is from Greg Elifritz. He says what his advice is is to make a judgment call kind of based on the age of the officer, how much experience you may have. He, he says he does not inform if he's not legally required to if it's a young officer because just out of training, more easily excitable. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think that's, as a, as a rule of thumb, that's probably good advice, although it, it's it's difficult. Uh, obviously, Greg, having been a former officer, he's probably got a better sense for that when he interacts with somebody. He can sort of thin slice and assess whether or not it's a person that uh, he should inform or not. Um, whether or not the, the rest of us have that ability, I'm not sure, but I think age is probably a good, a good factor to consider. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I think generally my rule of thumb is that I'm going to going to inform uh, no matter what the age, just because I don't want the, the, the firearm to be a surprise if it does come up for some reason during the encounter. I don't anticipate that it, it would in most encounters, but I don't want it to be a surprise because I think that's, that's the worst possible outcome. Um, it, but I, I think to the extent that I'm disagreeing with Greg, obviously uh, Greg knows his stuff. Uh, and I think you should obviously consider his advice. He's, he's, uh, he knows what he's doing. I've trained with him uh, on a few occasions and should mention his website too, uh, Active Response Training. He's got a great, great website where he discusses the, this issue and, and many other issues as well for, for people who are not familiar with, with Greg. Um, but one thing too I want to mention real quickly, there are some states where there is a duty to inform even if you are not asked. There are some states where you are in, uh, required to inform, you have a duty to reform, inform if you are asked, only if you are asked, and then others where there's no duty to inform at all. So I thought that was an interesting uh, distinction too. Even among the duty to inform states, there are some where 
it's only a duty to inform if you're asked and others where you have a duty to inform no matter what. Yeah, I'm, and I honestly, from a political perspective, I don't believe there should be a duty to inform, period. I think it's a good idea. And even here in South Dakota, where there's not a requirement, I will, I will, you know, if, if I'm interacting with law enforcement on an official capacity where they're, where they're pulling me over for doing something on the roadway or whatever, if they're interacting me interacting with me on an official capacity, I will almost always inform simply because, like you said earlier, Alex, it, it, it gives them a clue that I'm a card carrying good guy. Uh, I, I always, especially here in South Dakota, I have the enhanced permit where you don't just you don't have to have a permit in South Dakota, period. Uh, but if you can just go to the lo- local sheriff's office and you go through the South Dakota background check and you get a permit that's good in about 30 states, you go through the enhanced permit process. You have to go through the additional background checks federally. And I and and there's some other steps you got to take. You have to go through a live fire training course. And I, I'll let the officer know I have a South Dakota enhanced permit and I'm carrying, it's currently on my right hip. How would you like to proceed? And I'll always put that in the officer's ballpark. How do they want to, uh, how do they want to handle this? Because I'm not in charge at that point. Law enforcement is. So um, my other, I, I never, from 20 years of driving truck, very early in my truck driving career, I started having back problems. My doctor said, part of your problems may be you're sitting on your wallet. You're not sitting straight. Put your wallet in your front damn pocket. I do. That makes it hard to get to when I'm in a sitting position. It also, when I make that that uh, when I make that uh, notification that I'm armed, when when they ask to see my license, I will say it's in my right front pocket. I have to lean over. I you know how do you? It, it makes the how do you proceed more clear. Um, so. Right. So that's, that's, the, that's the key component here is clear communication because that's where stops go bad is a lack of clear communication. If you do not understand the officer's directives and you do not communicate clearly to the officer, things can go bad. So make sure if you don't understand the officer, you ask for clarification before you move or before you attempt to comply with their directive. Absolutely. Well, we have totally burned up time for the the time we have today alex as i always do before we go if you would talk a little bit about forge of freedom and how people can get more stuff from you yeah so the forge of freedom podcast uh, is a podcast I, I released earlier this year we're at uh, episode 74 now so 75 will be coming out on monday that will be a monday Monday episode with my father mike Willie, who's also an attorney and a firearms instructor uh, so the Monday Gun Day episodes are obviously gun-related podcasts, and the ones that are released on Friday are more broadly freedom-related podcasts. And obviously the right to keep and bear arms is very important to me, but more broadly, freedom is important to me. And I want to uh, spread the ideas of freedom and inspire people to take personal responsibility for, for themselves and their loved ones so that we can have freedom for the rest of our lives and preserve it for future generations as well. Uh, so check that out. It's on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, uh, on those sources by video, and then it's also available on most podcast streaming platforms. Yeah, um, do absolutely check that out. Alex always puts out a great show, um, and I've learned a lot by 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 listening to his stuff. I, and I got to be honest, I normally listen. I normally don't watch. It's it's going on in this. It's it's playing in the studios. I'm setting up for other things. Um. That's going to do it for us today. Uh, we, I will be back. My plan is for the this weekend for there to be a weekend show on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. Also, Monday night at 7 p.m. Central Time is going to be the uh, regular Polite Society podcast show. Again, thanks, to everybody, for watching. Podcast listeners, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this. And we will be back in two weeks with another uh, legal Friday with Alex until then everybody uh, until tomorrow uh, Sunday night everybody thanks for watching and we'll see you next time okay we are clear
Um, I, last time I mentioned 